A Ball Player's Career Being the Personal Experiences and Reminiscences of Adrian C. Anson, Late Manager and Captain of the Chicago Baseball Club, 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Martin. A Ball Player's Career. Chapter 3. Some Facts About the National Game. Just at what particular time the baseball fever became epidemic in Marshalltown, it is difficult to say, for the reason that, unfortunately, all of the records of the game there, together with the trophies accumulated, were destroyed by a fire that swept the place in 1897, and that also destroyed all of the files of the newspapers then published there. The fever had been raging in the East many years previous to that time, however, and had gradually worked its way over the mountains and across the broad prairies until the sport had obtained a foothold in every little village and hamlet in the land. Before entering further on my experience, it may be well to give here and now a brief history of the game and its origin. When and where the game first made its appearance is a matter of great uncertainty, but the general opinion of the historians seems to be that by some mysterious process of evolution it developed from the boys' game of more than a century ago, then known as, quote, one old cat, unquote, in which there was a pitcher, a catcher, and a batter. John M. Ward, a famous baseball player in his day, and now a prosperous lawyer in the city of Brooklyn, and the late Professor Proctor, carried on a controversy through the columns of the New York newspapers in 1888, the latter claiming that baseball was taken from the old English game of, quote, rounders, unquote, while Ward argued that baseball was evolved from the boys' game, as above stated, and was distinctly an American game, he plainly proving that it had no connection whatever with rounders. The game of baseball probably owed its name to the fact that bases were used in making its runs, and were one of its prominent features. There seems to be no doubt that the game was played in the United States as early, at least, as the beginning of the present century, for Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes declared a few years ago that baseball was one of the sports of his college days, and the autocrat of the breakfast table graduated at Harvard in 1829. Along in 1842, a number of gentlemen, residents of New York City, were in the habit of playing the game as a means of exercise on the vacant lot at the corner of 4th Avenue and 26th Street, where Madison Square Garden now stands. In 1845 they formed themselves into a permanent organization known as the Knickerbocker Club, and drew up the first code of playing rules of the game, which were very simple as compared with the complex rules which govern the game of the present time, and which are certainly changed in such a way as to keep one busy in keeping track of them. The grounds of this parent organization were soon transferred to the Elysian Fields at Hoboken, New Jersey, where the Knickerbockers played their first match game on June 19, 1846, their opponents not being an organized club, but merely a party of gentlemen who played together frequently, and styled themselves the New York Club. The New Yorks won easily in four innings, the game in those days being won by the club first making twenty-one runs on even innings. The Knickerbockers played at Hoboken for many years, passing out of existence only in 1882. In 1853 the Olympic Club of Philadelphia was organized for the purpose of playing town ball, a game which had some slight resemblance to baseball. The Olympic Club, however, did not adopt the game of baseball until 1860, and consequently cannot claim priority over the Knickerbockers, although it was one of the oldest ball-playing organizations in existence and was disbanded only a few years ago. In New England, a game of baseball known by the distinctive title of, quote, the New England game, unquote, was in vogue about fifty years ago. It was played with a small, light ball, which was thrown overhand to the bat, 
and was different from the New York game, as practiced by the Knickerbockers, Gotham, Eagle, and Empire clubs of that city. The first regularly organized club in Massachusetts, playing the present style of baseball, was the Olympic Club of Boston, which was established in 1854, and in the following year participated in the first match game played in that locality, its opponents being the Elm Tree team. The first match games in Philadelphia, San Francisco, and Washington were played in 1860. For several years the Knickerbocker Club was alone in the field, but after a while similar clubs began to organize, while in 1857 an association was formed which the following year developed into the National Association. The series of rules prepared by a committee of the principal clubs of New York City governed all games prior to 1857. But on January 22, 1857, a convention of clubs was held at which a new code of rules was enacted. On March 10, 1858, delegates from 25 clubs of New York and Brooklyn met and organized the National Association of Baseball Players, which for 13 successive seasons annually revised the playing rules and decided all disputes arising in baseball. The first series of contests for the championship took place during 1858 and 1859. At that time the Elysian Fields, Hoboken, New Jersey, were the great center of baseball playing, and here the Knickerbockers, Eagle, Gotham, and Empire Clubs of New York City ruled supreme. A rival sprung up, however, in the Atlantic Club of Brooklyn, and its success led to the arrangement of a series of games between selected nines of the New York and Brooklyn Clubs in 1858. In these encounters New York proved victorious, winning the first and third games by the respective scores of 22 to 18 and 29 to 18, while Brooklyn won the second contest by 29 to 8. In October 1861, another contest took place between the representative nines of New York and Brooklyn for the silver ball presented by the New York Clipper, and Brooklyn easily won by a score of 18 to 6. The Civil War materially affected the progress of the game in 1861, 62, and 63, and but little baseball was played, many wielders of the bat having laid aside the ash to shoulder the musket. The Atlantic and Eckford clubs of Brooklyn were the chief contestants for the championship in 1862, the Eckfords then wresting the championship away from the Atlantics, and retaining it also during the succeeding season when they were credited with an unbroken succession of victories. The champion nine of the Eckford Club in 1863 were Sprague, pitcher, Beach, catcher, Roach, Wood, and Duffy on the bases, Devere, shortstop, and Manolt, Swandell, and Josh Snyder in the outfield. The championship reverted back to the Atlantics in 1864 and they held the nominal title until near the close of 1867, their chief competitors being the Athletics of Philadelphia and the Mutuals of New York City. The Athletics held the nominal championship longer than any other club, and also claimed the credit of not being defeated in any game played during 1864 and 1865, the feat of going through two successive seasons without a defeat being unprecedented at that time in baseball history. The Eckfords of Brooklyn, however, went through the season of 1863 without losing a game, and the Cincinnati Reds, under the management of the late Harry Wright, accomplished a similar feat in 1869, the latter at that time meeting all of the best teams in the country both east and west. The Atlantic's champion nine in 1864 and 1865 were Pratt, pitcher, Pierce, catcher, Stark, Crane, and C. Smith on the bases, Galvin, shortstop, and Chapman, P. O'Brien, and S. Smith in the outfield. Frank Norton caught during the latter part of the season, and Pierce played shortstop. The Athletics in 1866 played all of the strongest clubs in the country, and were only twice defeated, 
once by the Atlantics of Brooklyn, and once by the Unions of Morrisania. The first game between the Atlantics and Athletics for the championship took place October 1st, 1866, in Philadelphia, the number of people present inside and outside the enclosed grounds being estimated as high as 30,000, it being the largest attendance known at the baseball game up to that time. Inside the enclosure the crowd was immense, and packed so close there was no room for the players to field. An attempt was made, however, to play the game, but one inning was sufficient to show that it was impossible, and after a vain attempt to clear the field, both parties reluctantly consented to a postponement. The postponed game was played October 22nd in Philadelphia. The price of tickets was placed at one dollar and upwards, and two thousand people paid the, quote, steep, unquote, price of admission the highest ever charged for mere admission to the grounds, while five or six thousand more witnessed the game from the surrounding embankment. Rain and darkness obliged the umpire to call the game at the end of the second inning, the victory remaining with the athletics by the decisive totals of thirty-one to twelve. A dispute about the gate money prevented the playing of the decisive game of the season. The Unions of Morrisania, by defeating the Atlantics in two out of three games in the latter part of the season of 1867, became entitled to the nominal championship, which, during the next two seasons, was shifted back and forth between the leading clubs of New York and Brooklyn. The Athletics in 1868 and the Cincinnati's in 1869 had, however, the best records of their respective seasons and were generally acknowledged as the virtual champions. The Athletics of Philadelphia in 1866 had McBride pitcher, Dockney catcher, Birkenstock, Reach, and Pike on the bases, Wilkins shortstop, and Sensenderfer, Fizzler, and Kleinfelder in the outfield. Their nine presented few changes during the next two seasons, Dockney, Birkenstock, and Pike giving way to Radcliffe, Cuthbert, and Barry in 1867, and Schaefer taking Kleinfelder's place in 1868. The Cincinnati Nine in 1869 were Brainerd, pitcher, Allison, catcher, Gould, Sweezy, and Waterman on the bases, George Wright, shortstop, and Leonard, Harry Wright, and McVeigh in the outfield. In 1868, the late Frank Queen, proprietor and editor of the New York Clipper, offered a series of prizes to be contested for by the leading clubs of the country, a gold ball being offered for the champion club, and a gold badge to the player in each position, from catcher to right field, who had the best batting average. The official award gave the majority of the prizes to the athletic club. McBride, Radcliffe, Fizzler, Reach, and Sensenderfer, having excelled in their respective positions of pitcher, catcher, first base, second base, and center field. Waterman, Hatfield, and Johnson of the Cincinnati's excelled in the positions of third base, left field, and right field, and George Wright of the Unions of Morrisania as shortstop. The gold ball was also officially awarded to the Athletics as the emblem of championship for the season of 1868. The Atlantics of Brooklyn were virtually the champions of 1870, being the first club to deprive the Cincinnati Reds of the prestige of invincibility which had marked their career during the preceding season. The inaugural contest between these clubs in 1870 took place June 14th on the Capitoline grounds at Brooklyn, New York, the Atlantics then winning by a score of 8-7 to seven after an exciting struggle of 11 innings. The return game was played September 2nd in Cincinnati, Ohio, and resulted in a decisive victory for the Reds by a score of 14 to 3. This necessitated a third or decisive game, which was played in Philadelphia October 6th, and this the Atlantics won by a score of 11 to 7. The Atlantics in that year had Zedline, pitcher, Ferguson, catcher, start, Pike and Smith on the bases, 
Pierce, shortstop, and Chapman, Hall, and MacDonald on the outfield. The newspapers throughout the country had, by this time, begun to pay unusual attention to the game, and the craze was spreading like wildfire all over the country, every little country town boasting of its nine, and as these were for the greater part made up of home players, local feeling ran high, and the doings of, quote, our team, unquote, furnished the chief subject of conversation at the corner grocery, and wherever else the citizens were wont to congregate. With the advent of the professional player, the game in the larger towns took on a new lease of life, but in the smaller places where they could not afford the expense necessary to the keeping of a first-class team, it ceased to be the main attraction, and interest was centered in the doings of the teams of the larger places. That the professional player improved the game itself goes without saying, as being a business with him instead of a pastime, and one upon which his daily bread depended, he went into it with his whole soul, developing its beauties in a way that was impossible to the amateur, who could only give to it the time that he could spare after the business hours of the day. This was the situation at the time that I first entered the baseball arena, and, looking back, when I come to compare the games of those days with the games of today, and note the many changes that have taken place, I cannot but marvel at the improvement made and at the interest that the game has everywhere excited. End of chapter 3 Recording by David Martin